thank you for listening to the Children's Hour podcast. Did you know that for a very limited amount of time, you can get a deck of the Children's Hour playing cards with every $25 donation? These make a perfect gift for the holidays, for any little one, no matter their age, in your family, and they really help us out a lot. Visit Children's Hour dot org and get your deck of children's hour playing cards today. What did one sock puppet say to the other? I don't know what. You look like you could use a hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for the children's hour. Kids Public Radio. This live Children's Hour was recorded in October 2019 at the Albuquerque Museum. In a mellow tone, feeling fancy free, and I'm not alone, I've got company, everything's okay. for Allison and friends. This is the Children's Hour. We are broadcasting from the Albuquerque Museum in the heart of Albuquerque's old town here in New Mexico. And we got an awesome audience here. Hello, audience. 
And we even have a wonderful kids crew behind me. I am Katie Stone. I'm always so happy to be with you every time I'm with you, but uh, let me introduce the crew here. Let's let them introduce themselves. Hello, hello, it's Zen. Hi, I'm Sienna. Yellow, it's Haley. Hi, it's Siobhan. Happy day, it's Maya. Hi, it's Lucas. Hi, it's Isaac. Hi, it's Daniel. Hi, it's Evan. Hello, it's Amadeus. cock a doodle doo it's Maya Lou. <laughs> So happy to have all of you with us today. Does anyone uh, on my crew know much about Jim Henson? Please, yes. I know he did a lot of cool stuff with puppets. Anyone else? He also created the Muppets. He did. And along with lots of other things, you've seen the fingerprints of Jim Henson in movies and in all kinds of kids shows all over the place. For example, Yoda is a Jim Henson creation, and uh, hey Bert, Ernie, and Bert, and Kermit. That's glad to hear. I hear it's uh, pretty darn cool to be a fan of Kermit. <laughs> <laughs> Kermit, don't you have a joke for us? Well, sure I do, Katie. What do you call a bean that became a puppet? A bean that became a puppet? You betcha. I, 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 well, can you guys help me? I don't know. I don't know. What? Garbanzo the Great! <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty great. Well, uh, we want to thank you very much for having us here at the Albuquerque Museum. Um, we are quite thrilled to be here. And uh, we wanted to play something because I wanted folks to know a little bit more about Jim Henson. So what I want to do is play a little something for you. But first, how about a little bit of Jim Henson's own voice, eh? Oh, rubber ducky, you're the one. You make bath time lots of fun. Rubber ducky, I'm awfully fond of you. Bo -bo -bo -dio. Rubber ducky, joy of joy. When I squeeze you, you make noise. Rubber ducky, you're my very best friend, it's true. Jim Henson is probably best known for his most beloved character. Greetings, Kermit the Frog here. Kermit was his invention long before the rest of the Muppets came on stage. But the story of Kermit and Jim Henson starts back in 1954, when Jim Henson was still in high school. He got a job at WTOP-TV, where he made puppets for a children's program called The Junior Morning Show. When still a freshman in college, Jim Henson was asked to create a five-minute puppet show for WCR-TV. It was on Sam and Friends that Kermit the Frog made his debut and several other Muppet characters, too. While working on Sam and Friends, Jim met Jane Nebel, who assisted him in creating the puppets. The two fell in love and were married in 1959 and had five children together. Jim Henson was a featured guest on many TV shows, including The Ed Sullivan Show, where he was on with the Rolling Stones, and where he was misintroduced as Jim Newsom and his puppets. Now here for all of the youngsters of the country and Canada are the Rolling Stones. Even though he had lots of success with Sam and Friends, Jim wasn't convinced that puppetry was for him. He went on a wanderlust to Europe, and there he was inspired by the puppet theater he saw. He recognized that puppetry had the potential to entertain everybody, not just children. It was during this time that he met Frank Oz, the voice behind Yoda and Miss Piggy and Grover. Frank and Jim were dear friends for the rest of Jim Henson's life. In 1969, the Children's Television Workshop sought out Jim Henson for a new production they were creating to help children who didn't have access to preschool learn basic skills through public television. Can you tell me how to get, how to get to Sesame Street? Sesame Street was born, and the rest could be history, but Sesame Street endures to this day, with many of the characters created 
literally crafted by the hands and heart of Jim Henson. He played Kermit, Ernie, Rolf the Dog, Guy Smiley, Dr. Teeth, and many, many other characters. But Jim Henson still wanted to entertain everybody, not just kids. His lifelong dream of a TV show made with puppets but geared towards an all-ages audience came to fruition in the first-ever season of Saturday Night Live. Live from New York, it's Saturday Night! Frank Oz and Jim Henson created 11 Land of Gorch sketches that aired in 1975 and 1976. Come with us now from the bubbling tar pits to the sulfurous wasteland, from the rotting forest to the stagnant mudflats, to the land of Gorch. Sadly, Gorch didn't stick on Saturday Night Live, but Henson was already on to his next project, The Muppet Show. On the program, Jim Henson performed as many characters, Kermit, of course, but the Swedish chef, Waldorf, Log Hogthrop, many others. Three years later, the Muppets appeared in their first full-length film, The Muppet Movie. It was an instant hit and remains one of the favorite kid movies of all time. And as if there wasn't enough happening in his life, Jim Henson started working on other projects. A friend of his named George Lucas hired him to create a character we all know and love from The Empire Strikes Back, the Jedi Master, Yoda. Size matters not. Look at me. Does me by my size, do you? <clears throat> Frank Oz did Yoda's voice, and Yoda became the most popular character in the Star Wars franchise. Jim and Frank wrote and produced The Dark Crystal in 1982, and then The Muppets Take Manhattan. And in 1986, the studio had a flop, but it later became a cult classic, starring David Bowie. The movie The Labyrinth is a dark fantasy, written and directed by Henson, that features Bowie's music as well. You were laughing at the babe. Babe with the power. Power of voodoo. You do. Remind me of the babe. Jim Henson's work encompassed his whole life. His five children worked for his company from the time they were small. Jim Henson's life was cut short at 53 years old in 1990, but his legacy lives on. Somebody thought of that And someone believed it Look what it's done so far What's so amazing That keeps us stargazing What do we think we might see? Nakako Ike The rainbow all of us under its spell We know that they're probably magic Have 
you meet each day. Oh, hi there, little fella. Oh. Hey, listen, you know who you could be if I gave you this little hat and a bag to carry over your shoulder? Well, I could be a laundry man. No, not a laundry man. How about man. Santa Claus? No, 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 not Santa Claus. What's wrong with Santa Claus? There's nothing wrong with Santa Claus. Don't but... you like Christmas? Oh, I love Christmas, but you could be the postman. A postman? Hmm. Oh, the postman always brings dumb mail through rain or snow or sleet or hail. I'll work and work the whole day through To get your letter safe to you Cause the postman is a person in your neighborhood In your neighborhood He's in your neighborhood A postman, a postman is, is a person in your neighborhood A person that you meet each day well, I'll see you around hey, Okay, hey, watch it, where are you going to a fire? Hey, speaking of a fire a Fire, what fire? <laughs> No, there's no fire at all, but you know who you could be if I gave you this little shiny red hat? Yeah, Santa Claus. No, not no. Santa Claus. No, no, no. Red Riding Hood. No, 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 not Red Riding Hood. You could be a fireman. A fireman? Holy smoke. <laughs> oh, a fireman is brave, it's said. His engine is a shiny red. If there's a fire anywhere about, well, I'll be sure to put it out. Cause a fireman is a person in your neighborhood In your neighborhood He's in your neighborhood And a postman is a person in your neighborhood Well, they're the people that you meet When you're walking down the street They're the people that you meet Each day You're listening to the Children's Hour Kids Public Radio We'll be right back the Children's Hour is produced by the Children's Hour Incorporated, a nonprofit dedicated to producing high quality kids public radio. Find out more at childrenshour.org. Support provided by Electric Playhouse, an all ages dining and interactive entertainment wonderland based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Experience gaming in a whole new way, transporting you to another reality. See for yourself at electricplayhouse.com. Support is also provided by the City of Albuquerque Cultural Services Department and the Urban Enhancement Trust Fund. In case you're just joining us, this episode of the Children's Hour was recorded before a live audience at the Albuquerque Museum in October 2019. I could not be more delighted to have with us on this stage and next to us, me, right now, rubbing elbows with Cheryl Henson. She is the daughter of Jim Henson. I think you have some fans. Cheryl Henson has a long career in puppetry and puppet mastery and theater, and we could say a lot about you, but please come to the mic. Tell us more about yourself. Hi, I'm Cheryl Henson, and I'm the second oldest of Jim and Jane Henson's five children. Wow. So you worked with your dad from the time you were a little kid. Is that right? 
Well, I really started building puppets when I was 15. So when I was in high school was the first time that I, that I had the opportunity to build puppets in the Muppet workshop in London for the Muppet Show. And that was really exciting. But when I was really little, we actually did some puppet shows in the schools. My dad was always getting invited to come to our schools and put something on, and they'd, they'd rope us into it. But I don't think I really took it seriously until I was in high school. Um, yeah, please, come to your mic. How many Muppets were people and how many Muppets were animals? That's a really interesting question because there's a whole third category of creatures and monsters and things that you've never seen any place other than right there as Muppets. And so I'd say there are a whole bunch of all, all three of those categories. <laughs> what was your favorite Muppet? Oh, gosh. I'd say that n since my father passed away, that Kermit is my favorite Muppet because particularly my, when my father performed Kermit, the, the early clips, his own Kermit, um, because he is my father. And um, all of my father's characters have some aspect of his own personality in them. That's really puppetry works best when you're able to draw from inside of yourself to pull out a character. So all the characters he did have some aspect of him, but the one that's closest to his personality is Kermit. And he's the one who's kind, considerate, uh, trying to pull a whole bunch of crazies all together, but then he'll go, he'll get really upset, and he'll, like he's, he has very multifaceted character, I think, Kermit is. So Kermit's my favorite. But when I was a kid, actually my favorite when I was a kid was Grover. I thought that Frank Oz's Grover was just brilliant, and I loved his sense of humor. So I still love Grover, and I love Kermit, and then I went through a Robin the Frog phase where I really loved a small frog of Robin. So halfway maybe. down the stairs, that's Robin. That is Robin. And there was a show all around Robin called The Frog Prince, where Robin was the frog prince who wanted to get kissed. And I loved that show. What puppets did you make in The Muppet Show? Oh, very good question. The very first puppets that I made in The Muppet Show were for the first season in 1976. And my sister and I were invited to make fruits and vegetables for a fruit and vegetable stand. And I made a grapefruit, a asparagus, a artichoke, and a melon. And my sister made a tomato. And they were in the fruit and vegetable stand. And the only thing we didn't make were bananas because the song they were singing is, yes, we have no bananas. <laughs> That was my first one. And that same season, we did lobsters for the Swedish chef to cook. I love that lobster one. I remember that. And the ones I made were the lobster banditos that had little cap guns and bandoliers. And so mine were the lobsters that came and saved the lady lobster. How about that? Okay. What's your favorite part of creating a Muppet? Well, you know, I have to say that creating a Muppet is a very collaborative event, that they're incredible fantastic puppet builders, puppet designers, and then the performers themselves bring a lot to the character with the voice, but also the script writers who are writing the script and coming up with how those characters are going to be interacting. So I'd say that almost all of the Muppet characters are a collaboration between a really interesting group of tightly knit, talented people. Did you make Miss Piggy? I did not. Actually, the woman who made Miss Piggy was here just the other day, um, named Bonnie Erickson, and she set up the puppets here in this exhibition. So she built the original Miss Piggy. Um, so I heard that you helped with your father with making the Muppets. Did you ever voice any of the Muppet characters? I did not. I was terrified to use my own voice. So I did background characters, and then I made more of a career as a puppet builder. But my brother Brian uh, was a very good puppeteer, and he did lots of voices. Did you ever, like, were you ever the puppeteer behind the puppets, like, controlling them? Um, I, when I, I did background puppets, but I tell you, my expertise is not as a puppeteer. It's much more um, supporting the, the puppeteers. So for all those out in Radioland who really want to be puppeteers when they grow up, mm. um, what is the education and what do you have to do to become a puppeteer? That's a really interesting question. Well, first you want to build your own puppets and start puppeteering because a lot of it comes from inside yourself. 
And so just go ahead and start building stuff and start puppeteering. A mirror or a video camera or even a, tele a phone or an iPad is a great way to get started. Um, there are university programs for it. The University of Connecticut at Stores has a particularly good program, but there are a number of other uh, programs around the country as well. Um, there's also a really good organization called the Puppeteers of America. And pu Yay! Yay! We have puppeteers in the audience. Um, the Puppeteers of America has festivals every summer, and they also have a really great um, way of interconnecting puppeteers. And if you really want to do it, you want to practice at home, and then you want to apprentice and work for a puppeteer. It's the best way to do it. How is your life different as a kid having Jim Henson as your dad? Oh, that's so nice. Um, I would say that basically our lives were pretty regular kid lives, particularly when you have five kids in the family. Like, home life is, uh, you know, it keeps you honest. Um, but, <laughs> but I would say that both of my parents were artists and creators, and that they really encouraged us to learn a lot of skills for making things. And so we were always making things at home. All different kinds of crafts, whether it's um, uh, fabric arts or um, painting, copper enamel, woodworking. It's really important to, to really get in there and just make stuff, whatever that thing is. And I think that's something that both of my parents really encouraged. Was he a funny dad? Did he make you guys laugh a lot? Because he sure made us laugh a lot. You know, because I know sometimes funny people can be really funny on stage, and then they are not so funny off stage. But I bet your dad had a pretty good sense of humor. Yes, he did. He had a good sense of humor. He also was pretty quiet, though. And I think he, he was a pretty shy person in real life and that a lot of his uh, crazy humor came out through the puppets. And I think that for people who are uh, naturally shy, that puppetry, but they have a really great sense of humor inside, that puppetry is a fantastic outlet. Cheryl Henson, the daughter of Jim Henson, thank you so much for being with us on the Children's Hour. <laughs> Way down the stairs is a stair where I sit There isn't any other stair quite like it I'm not at the bottom, I'm not at the top So this is the stair where I always stop Way up the stairs isn't up and isn't down. It isn't in the nursery, it isn't in the town. And all sorts of funny thoughts run round my head. It isn't really anywhere, it's somewhere else instead. Way down the stairs is a stair where I sit There isn't any other stair quite like it I'm not at the bottom, I'm not at the top So this is the stair where I always stop Diana Panton from her CD, I Believe in Little Things, with Kermit's nephew's song, Halfway Down the Stairs. And before our interview with Cheryl Henson, you heard People in Your Neighborhood, which is Bob and the Anything Muppets, and way back when, the Rainbow Connection mashup, I made that. That's Kermit, the Dixie Chicks, all kinds of folks are on that little mashup. Well, you're listening to the Children's Hour in a show we recorded in October 2019 at the Albuquerque Museum. <laughs> May I introduce the Lauren Kahn Puppet Theater? All right. 
All right, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming, I'm going as fast as I can go. Yeah. If I had wheels, I would have been a wagon. All right, I'm gonna, oh, look at chair, great. I'm gonna sit down, but not too fast. On the count of three is good. One, good, thank you. Two, almost, uh, three. Very, well, look at that. I didn't, I didn't hear all of you come in. What a beautiful surprise. <laughs> just a moment, I, I just gonna get cozy. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> now, look at that, you remind me of my grandchildren. <laughs> well, I have 27 grandchildren, maybe 28. I didn't count them today. <laughs> Yeah, but they're not so quiet and well-behaved. As, are you always so well-behaved? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Are you always so honest? Yeah. <laughs> Makes me want to tell a story. Yeah. I know about 150. Yeah. All true, too. <laughs> so this one involves a man who once upon a time had to tell his wife, his very beloved wife, something that was obsessing him. It was bothering him. He said, my dear wife, I must leave now because I have to find something that I cannot live without. And when I find it, I will come back. I have to find the truth. Oh my goodness. I don't know what his wife thought at that moment. But she loved her husband. She wished him success. And he packed a small bag and he set off on an adventure for which I, I cannot even imagine. He visited different continents. He visited the desert, the sea, and not just visited. He was looking everywhere to find something that spoke to him that said, this is the truth. And finally, he was one day in a forest, many tall trees. Night was coming and a very, very huge storm. The trees were blowing from side to side. It was pouring rain, lightning, and he had no shelter. So he began to look around and it was getting darker by the second. And he saw a cave. And as he approached the cave, he began to caution himself. Maybe, you know, I'm not the only one looking for shelter. Maybe there's a bear inside. Better be careful. Maybe there's a snake or something I never even imagined inside. But the weather was really forcing him closer. And as he approached the entrance of the cave, there was a terrible smell. Terrible, disgusting. But the weather, you know, <laughs> it was driving him. So he made another step into the darkness of the cave. Nothing attacked. And as his eyes began to focus in the dark, he saw at the very end of the cave there was a person. And he realized it was an old woman, maybe my age. Maybe older, I don't know. But she was smelling so terrible. He didn't know what to do. And, and her hair, it was very thin and greasy. It looked like little animals were running around. Her teeth, mostly gone. Her hands were black. She was filthy. But the weather, you know, he stepped in further. And then the woman spoke. And when she spoke, her voice was so extraordinary so crystal clear, so exceptional, he realized when he heard her voice that he was in the presence of truth. It was beyond his greatest dream, and he stayed with this woman for one year and one day until it was time for him to leave. And he said to her, my, my dear, dear Lady Truth, 
You've given to me so much. What could I possibly give to you in return? Well, she leaned back. She scratched her greasy hair, all two pieces. She chuckled a little bit, and she leaned forward. And she said to him, you know, when you go out and talk about me, tell everyone I'm young and beautiful. <laughs> oh, that was the lie of the truth. Can you imagine? Uh, my dear friends, it's time for me to go. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Trick. Just eat some ice cream and then keep the stick, oh yeah. Oh, la, 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 la. Cut out his body from an index card. Draw on the clothes of a security guard, oh yeah. Oh, la, 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 la. Now do the card so it stays and then you. Made a puppet to play That's right Just look around There are so many things to transform Pick out clothes from the hamper And a puppet is born Oh yeah Children's Hour is supported in part by an award from New Mexico Arts, a division of the Department of Cultural Affairs, and by the National Endowment for the Arts. Support for the Children's Hour is provided by Token Ibis, a nonprofit making philanthropy accessible to everyone. To sign up, go to tokenibis.org. You're listening to the Children's Hour in an episode that was recorded at the Albuquerque Museum in October 2019. So I am a big fan of yours, Lauren Kahn, and I want to thank you for being with us on the Children's Hour. It's my pleasure. Thank you. 
It is really such a joy to watch you do that. And your story was great for radio, too. And for our radio audience, we did post pictures to our Instagram account and Facebook and Twitter. We're at TCH Radio. That little old lady, it's a very different kind of puppet from the kind of puppets that Jim Henson makes, isn't it? Can you tell a little bit about that? Well, it has some relationship because it has a rod. <laughs> um, the Muppets, and well, Muppets, not all the puppets of Mr. Henson, but they have rods. But Natalia's a hand and rod puppet, meaning you have your hand in her head and you manipulate her extremities with rods. For our listening audience out in Radioland, Lauren was wearing a veil that's black over her head, and she's dressed all in black, and you really forget that she's there, and you find yourself believing and really hearing this old lady puppet. It's pretty amazing. I, I, I forget that I'm there, too, sometimes. <laughs> that's always the best experience. What inspired you and like, made you want to become a puppeteer? Well, I, as Cheryl Henson said about her dad, was also an extremely shy person for whom it was very difficult to talk to more than one person at a time. And I, I always loved stories, and I, I was, was studying mime because you didn't have to talk. And I found a puppet one day in a secondhand store, and it said something clicked. I said, oh, that's interesting. So I started trying to make them, having had no experience doing that, and then it just grew from there. Where do you do puppet shows? Oh, in my life, uh, a lot of schools, theaters, museums, hospitals, libraries, people's homes, um, parks, fairs, just the, anywhere. What's your favorite part about puppeteering? Oh, I think well, my favorite part is when the puppets make me laugh or when the puppets make me feel something. When they have a... It's, I think you're like a channel when you do puppetry, and um, although I agree that it's a lot of your own stuff coming out, but you get to let out stuff that you don't often let free. <laughs> How do you make a puppet? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, sometimes the puppet, you, you, sometimes you have an idea for a head of a puppet, and then the materials will tell you that your idea wasn't really the, what they wanted to do. You just sort of start out making it, and then make your own amends or you make your own compromises with the materials until something jumps out at you. And often the best one is the surprise one, the one you didn't intend to make. How many puppets do you have? I've never counted them, but 50, my partner's flashing decades of fingers at me. I, I say <laughs> I, maybe 40, 50, you know, ones I've really used intensely in my life. How many ways are there to control a puppet? Ooh la la, how many ways are there to control a puppet? As many ways as you can imagine. I mean, it depends on the puppet. A puppet could be a rock, and then you're moving it around with your fingers, or a puppet could have many, many, many strings, hundreds of strings, and so it just depends on the method of manipulation. What are the biggest and smallest puppets you've ever seen? Ah, the biggest puppets, I think, are the Macy Day Parade, but perhaps Cheryl Henson has another... I, that I've ever witnessed. The Bread and Puppet Theater makes some pretty large puppets, too, in Vermont. And smallest puppets, ooh, I think they're marbles. I think kids play with puppets all, we all play with puppets all the time. It can be a, a spoon. So as tiny as a marble could be a wonderful puppet. Where do you get all the ideas for, like, the characters that your puppets are going to have? Um, I think from my heart. <laughs> um, I think um, I also have a frog puppet. And I think uh, he's a lot of my personality, too. His name is Floppo. And um, I think it's from my heart. And Natalia, the puppet I just performed, is from my, was inspired, I think, by my great-grandmother, whose name was Natalia, and several other people. <laughs> Lauren Kahn, Puppet Theater, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
fingers and I'll turn you some flips I'm your puppet puppy I used to enjoy reading about Winnie the Pooh. He's a bear, like Fozzie Bear, but, well, not very much like Fozzie Bear. This is a song he would sing when somebody would say something he didn't quite understand. He could have said, what? Or I beg your pardon? But Pooh would instead sing this song. Coddleston, Coddleston, Coddleston pie. A fly can't bird, but a bird can fly. Ask me a riddle, and I reply, Coddleston, Coddleston, Coddleston Pie. Now this is where the song changes key, what we call the modulation. That's G sharp minor. Coddleston, Coddleston, Coddleston Pie. A fish can't whistle, and neither can I. Ask me a riddle, and I reply. Coddleston, Coddleston, Coddleston Pie. Coddleston, Coddleston, Coddleston Pie. Why does a chicken, I don't know why. Ask me a riddle, and I reply. Coddleston, Coddleston, Coddleston Pie.
Cottlestone Pie is Jim Henson as Rolf the dog. And before that, you heard Los Mocosos with their version of I'm Your Puppet. The Children's Dollars are written and produced by Katie Stone at the Sunspot Solar Studio in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with help from all of us on the Kegs crew. Many thanks to the Albuquerque Museum for hosting this show back in October 2019. We also want to thank Cheryl Henson for joining us on the show, as well as the Lauren Kahn Puppet Theater. Our podcast can be found wherever you get your podcasts or at patreon.com slash the children's hour. We post photos and more on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Find us at TCH Radio. Find lots of information about us at childrenshour.org. The Children's Hour is distributed by the Children's Hour Incorporated and by the Public Radio Exchange, PRX, and by the Pacifica Radio Network. We'll be back next time with another edition of the Children's Hour. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. The ladybugs came to the ladybugs big, big. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. When they all played games at the ladybugs picnic. They had twelve sacks with the ransack races, and they fell on the backs, and they fell on the faces. Ladybugs twelve at the ladybugs picnic. They played jump rope, but the rope it broke, so they just sat around telling knock knock jokes. Ladybugs twelve. You've been listening to the Children's Hour. We're produced by the Children's Hour Incorporated, a tax exempt nonprofit based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we're dedicated to producing high quality kids' public radio. Find out more about us at childrenshour.org. Support provided by our sustaining listeners and from the city of Albuquerque. We are one Albuquerque, cabq.gov. We also had support from the Laughing Buddha Fund and the Limestone Foundation. Support was also provided by the Infinite Gesture Fund at the Albuquerque Community Foundation. Our theme music was written by C.K. Barlow. We'll be back next time for another edition of The Children's Hour, Kids Public Radio. I love the children's hour.